So, welcome everyone. I'm uh, glad to be here and present Multilingual Content in WordPress. Uh, my intention is for this to be a slightly higher level, non-technical talk, although I'll drop into it like a teeny bit of code here and there um, and configuration options. Uh, so just a quick overview. I'm going to talk just a little bit about like languages and the internet. Um, sorry, I can't see my slides. Uh, oh, well. Uh, Questions I think you should ask before you start any project, and this is kind of broad, any project, but also multilingual projects. Um, I'm gonna go over a few strategies for delivering content. I'm gonna discuss machine translation and where that technology's at and options you have to use it or not use it, uh, and, and as well as other translation options. Uh, I'm gonna get into some implementation choices that you have. Uh, there's some popular plugins. I'm not gonna try to Originally, I was going to discuss this a lot more, but I realized they're all paid plugins. So I'm going to try to address those, the big uh, players in the room when it comes to multilingual plugins. Uh, but I, I, hopefully, a lot of this talk is useful to you, even if you're, uh, you know, a open source vegan and refuse to pay for anything. Um, and we'll do some final thoughts. So about me, I'm a marketing director at Basis Technology. Uh, I've worked in WordPress for about 10 years. Um, and built over 20 projects. Five of them have been multilingual, and I'm a power user of WPML and Polylang. So if you're working with those, I'm happy to answer questions anytime. Um, just a note, if you look me up or look up Basis Technology, uh, one of the reasons I chose this talk is that Basis Technology is a multilingual text analytics vendor. So we spend our day discussing all kinds of languages and weird anomalies and compound words in German, and how can we help Pinterest identify the language of the post more accurately, uh, even though those pieces of text are short. None of that has anything to do with this talk. Um, it's just why I spend a lot of time thinking about multilingual problems. We have an office in Tokyo, which is uh, the reason that we have multilingual websites ourselves. Um, but just if you're looking at basis tech and trying to figure out how that fits into this talk, it doesn't really. We have a public API. If you're sophisticated, you can go check it out. Um, oops. This is kind of the stuff basis technology does. You know, If you're trying to track weapons transactions and Russian news articles, come talk to us. So, I wanted to start with just a little bit about language and language of the internet. Um, this is kind of a really cool visual. Uh, sorry, the language codes might be incomprehensible, but basically the nodes are languages. So, ZHO is Chinese, French, Spanish. Um, and the links are the editors of Wikipedia who edit languages and who edit posts in both languages. So, I think it's really interesting if you're just trying to think about serving an audience. Um, I, I, as I'll show you uh, in the slide. You know, English might be the most understood language, um, but that overlap isn't consistent. People are coming from other languages. There's different levels of comprehension. Um, overall, world population, I think Chinese is well known to be the most uh, common native language, uh, followed by Spanish. That's not represented by the internet, which is 50% in English, much closer to comprehension level. Um, but it kind of gets you to the point of, of, of like, who is your audience? What are your goals? What are they going to understand? Um, for my company, Basis, you know, we go to Japan, we want people to be really impressed that we're invested in that market and we're committed to them and, and we need to present our content in a certain way and with a certain level of accuracy to achieve that. Um, if, for instance, you're working for a nonprofit and you're just trying to get content to someone who will understand it, that's a very different goal. And, and the way you'll approach a multilingual project is very different. So, um, similarly, this is the uh, language stats for East Boston. Uh, over 50% the native language is Spanish. Um, and actually what this is trying to show right here is uh, that of the 50%, 76% uh, report that they don't speak English very well. Um, so I was uh, kind of looking for a good starting place for this talk and, and I think this goes for any WordPress project. Is who is your audience and what languages they speak and read as part of that? But it, it's, it's just a small piece. So, so really, you've got to just think about your whole audience. And then you need to think about how they're getting to your website. Um, it's very different, for instance, if you're a public school and people are going to find you no matter what, you're going to give them flyers with the URL on it, then if you need search engine optimization, uh, if you need to show up in a different language of search results, uh, you're going to have to have that language hosted on your site because Google is not going to direct people to your site and give it a translation all on its own. You're going to have to host that. Um, and also, 
you know, what are your goals to the audience and what is your budget is just really important to think about. If you don't have the money, it, it, you can't get into these really complicated projects. You're just going to end up with a Swiss cheese website of like different pages and different languages and it's not going to be particularly high quality. Um, <clears throat> so I was hunting around for a good example of a website that I thought was matching its audience pretty well as far as languages go, and I was looking at boston.gov, and I think they generally do an excellent job. Oh, sorry, I realize I'm not holding the mic. Is it okay? Um, so they have Spanish, they even have Creole French, which I think is really interesting. Um, they don't have Chinese. Uh, and I was super impressed, and I was looking around, and I was like, oh, what does Cambridge do? And Cambridge has this, and I was like, oh, Cambridge, that Google thing. That's how terrible. And then I was hunting around in the code, and I was like, wait a minute. These are both machine translation. Uh, Boston's actually using what looks like some sort of Microsoft translation API um, to translate on the fly. And I'll explain in a minute, it might be slightly better than that. They might actually be um, putting a little bit of human in the mix. I don't know. If anyone actually works at City Boston, I apologize. Um, and I actually, when I was thinking about it, this isn't actually a terrible option for them, uh, given resources and other concerns. So when you're just looking at your overall translation options, uh, I think these are pretty obvious. There's human translation, which comes with expense. There's machine translation, which could be free depending on your size of your project or very cheap. Um, and increasingly, there's these really nice, uh, I think this is probably the direction most people go in the future, of these kind of like custom models uh, for machine translation. So um, this is getting into things I know from working at Basis. A lot of these new machine translation algorithms are based on um, deep learning and machine learning. And if you can customize the training data to be closer to what you're translating, you'll get much better results. So if you train the model on eighth grade essays, it's gonna do a lot better job translating eighth grade essays. Um, so that goes for any sort of content, email or anything else. Um, and you can also do things like you can inject a translation memory. You can, uh, you know, with human translation, one of the biggest things you get is a translation memory. You say every time, like for instance, we have a product called Rosette Entity Extractor, and we have a very specific way we want that written in Japanese or German, and we have this translation memory. And that's one of the big values you're getting with a human translator is that they're using that, and they're looking at context, and they're fitting it in. Um, and you can add that to a custom model in Microsoft. You're getting a lot of the good parts. It's still going to make mistakes. Um, we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, consistency is generally much better with humans. Machine translation, like they could, you know, if you use Google today and Google tomorrow, they could change the algorithm overnight and you could get different results. Um, so uh, just a few tips on human translation. You generally want uh, people translating into their native tongue. This isn't to say, like, let's say you're a nonprofit and you have an intern who says they speak Spanish pretty well. Maybe give them a shot, check it out, see if you can have someone check their work. Don't you know, reject anyone who's not a native speaker. But in, you know, high-end translation, that's what you're looking for. That's how people tend to get hired. If they're not native, they've spoken it for dozens of years and lived there. Um, you always uh, test them. If you're gonna pay anybody, it, it, they might not even be a bad translator. They might just not be expertise in the topic that you're having translated, so if it's highly technical. Uh, they, they might just not know anything about the kinds of technology you're selling or, or, or you're working with, or they might not know anything about voting, if that's what you're working on. Um, when translators work, they generally have a translation memory, and there's all kinds of technology out there for a translation memory, but just one thing to note is if you're paying for translation or using a translator, that should be a deliverable you get. Um, you shouldn't just accept the article or the whatever it is. You should always ask for that memory, and you should be able to give it to another translator. That should be part of what you're paying for. Um, and then another important concept is just this idea of trans creation, like slogans, you know, Nike, just do it. Those things don't always translate well, so you gotta think about what you're asking people to do. Maybe what you're really asking them to do is rewrite a similar concept or similar thing in a different language. Um, and it just helps to know that the right term for that is trans creation. Uh, machine translation. So there's been vast improvements in machine translation in the past few years. There's a great write-up in the Financial Times and uh, the New York Times, I think, both around 2006, about the huge advances Google has been making in this area. So this is a Google chart, full disclosure. I'm sure they, you know, they're gonna make themselves look pretty good, but they're showing how close they can get to a human quality score. So the orange at the top is human. Neural is a deep neural network, so that's the new algorithm they're using. Um, 
and the phrase base is kind of the older method of like, this is a you know, string of text, here's the equivalent string of text in another language. Um, and it varies widely depending on language pair and direction. So English to Chinese is not gonna be the same as Chinese to English. It, it really, it, you have to think about uh, the pair and how that all fits together. Low resource languages are gonna perform much worse. There's just not any training data. Um, so if you wanted to use like Burmese, translation, there's just not a lot of text out there in the world for anyone to train a computer model to do good translation with. Um, so if you're doing a, you know, two popular languages, French to, you know, English, English to Spanish, um, you can look it up, you know, it's usually you can find some information online about the accuracy or comments, you know, people make, um, but it, it might be decent. Uh, this is kind of the flip side. This was actually brought to us by one of our customers. Um, they were trying to compile a report on the Battle of Raqqa, and they were showing us these articles that have, were translated from news sources that were like the Battle of Tenderness, and they thought it was very funny, but not very useful. Um, and that's because Raqqa in Arabic means the tenderness. Uh, so it's like the machine's right, but it's wrong. Uh, I could have found a lot funnier examples, but I thought this one was actually pretty relevant. Um, so uh, that's my quick overview of translation methods and quality. I'll jump into it a little bit more later, but I just want to get into implementation. So there's a few general strategies you have. So the first is, uh, we'll get into it, parallel text. So this is just side by side. This is the Rosetta Stone. It's um, depending on the audience, the right choice. So this was for a conference we were holding in Tokyo. It was for hip uh, tech people who, Generally, we're very, you know, American-focused. Uh, and my CEO, who was kind of the, who, whose project this was, felt that, it, you know, having separate websites would not serve the, you know, service purpose as well. There wasn't that much content. He wanted everything right next to each other. He thought, you know, it's nice to show the English and the Japanese, and maybe that would help. Um, the issue with this approach is that if you're doing anything with dynamic content, uh, you, you just get into these rabbit holes where like, this is just hard to parse in general. Uh, we got into this huge thing about the date format of time because like the talk is at one time, different cultures have different, you know, timestamps and it's not so hard in WordPress to go and like read how to make it appear in different time formats. But like putting both was ridiculous and confusing and then we ended up leaving it in the American format but this was actually a .jp website so that just was probably the wrong choice. Um, I think this is atrocious, but you know, it's like speaker, name, name, it, you can figure it out, but um, it's not great. For the right projects, maybe it saves you some time or it's a good choice. Um, we have the machine translation dynamically, so this is just being injected into your website live. You know, someone loads the page, it makes a call out to Google or Microsoft, it comes back, it swaps out the content. You've probably all experienced this when you visited a site in another language and you know, your browser, if you're using Chrome, asks you, like, do you want to translate this page? Um, same process, you can just add a button to your site, that's what Cambridge did. Uh, and I used to be really biased against this. I think a few years ago, I would have said this is a horrible, horrible thing to do. Like, why bother? Someone will just do it themselves if they want to. Um, increasingly, I think it's an okay option. It, it, it gives you some, uh, some capabilities, especially if you integrate it the way Boston has. Uh, you know, you might have a non-technical community that doesn't know how to find the translator they need. Um, and with these new models that are kind of a hybrid of custom, you know, of machine translation with a custom model, you could potentially have pretty good results, uh, much better than you were able to have before. I, I think some of my bias and, and probably other people's biases against machine translation is memories of those older, less accurate models. And it's never going to be perfect, but if you're on a budget, you have to make tough choices. Um, I, I think this is not a bad option. Um, and the other thing to note is you don't really need a WordPress plugin to do it. There's tons of plugins. I was like looking at them uh, recently and I was like, oh, you know, I, I don't know if I recommend any of these. Actually, if I was doing this personally, I'm a little more sophisticated. I would just go and like add it straight to the code. But there's plenty of plugins that'll do it for you in a few clicks. Um, the only thing I caution is like, if they're gonna create pages on your website or store things in your database, like those are things to watch out for because there's, you, you wanna get better plugins um, to do that. 
Uh, the other thing to know is that like this content's not going to show up in a search engine. It, this doesn't exist on your site. There's no Spanish anything. So if you want to be found in Spanish search results, you're going to have to have an actual Spanish language page. You know, in the header, it's going to have to have HTML lang equals es uh, to get picked up by Google. Um, whoops. No. Let's see if we come back. Okay. Yeah, and the, the other thing is um, the risk, and I don't know what Boston's doing if they're actually just using a live Microsoft translation. I think they have a huge opportunity to be embarrassed. So I was just saying, there's no opportunity to correct if you do this method, so just be aware of that. If your logo's on it, or your name, it, it's a risk. Um, the, the one big benefit, though, is you don't end up with this, which is like the Swiss cheese map of your translations. It, it's happened to me more times than I want to admit where, like, Someone will say like, okay, we're doing French, and then like there's a French homepage, and we start to do the blog, and then we do the management page because someone has a big meeting, and then we forget about it, and then we go, oh wait, the person we hired to translate the French was terrible, should we get rid of it? And then that person who said it was terrible leaves, and you're like, no idea what to think of this content, and whether it's better to delete it, or you're losing value. So there, there is that other benefit to using these machine translation services. Um, so the bulk of, of what people tend to do and what I've done is uh, hosted translation. So there's a couple of options to go about this. Um, you know, not least of which is just to uh, create a second website. And I, I didn't cover this in this talk, but I don't think that needs to be covered. You know, you can just create a multi-site, you can create a second website, you can copy your current site and maybe use that as a starting place. My friend works for a bike company that hired a German distributor. Uh, that German distributor has rights to do whatever they want in Germany, but they wanted a starting place, so they just copied their website, and the distributor's off running. I don't think anyone's too happy or too unhappy. You know, it seems to be working out, but it's an option. There's no connection between those sites. Um, but in most cases, you're going to want to take your current site. You're going to want to put up some sort of plugin into it or some sort of connection uh, so that your content can be linked, so that you can synchronize the content, um, and that's what we do. So, uh, you know, there's lots of advantages. Uh, search engine friendly, uh, you can use any translation. You could, and this is not really recommended, but you, know, you could put a machine translation on your site. I, re I really can't think of a use case where that makes any sense. Like, you know, at least if you're gonna use machine translation, do it on the fly and get the best possible. But maybe if you wanna sell shoes in Argentina and you think just translating the content will do that, it's your own site. Um, the big thing with these plugins is that like they're easy to install and they're like really hard to configure properly, especially uh, if you have any sort of you know advanced settings on your site. You have new different kinds of post types. Um, if you're you know hacking the blog in any odd way, uh, it's just going to up your complexity level, um, and you're going to kind of run into this scenario very quickly, which is like. You really want to be committed to the languages you configure in this thing. When I started at my company, the guy before me had configured it for seven languages. And every time he created a post, it would automatically copy that post to all seven languages, you know, without the content, without translating it. It would just create seven English language posts that were tagged as other languages. And it was so stupid. <laughs> and it just like, if you have a website that's kind of like teetering anyways, that's not running very fast, and then you start and like multiply the content you know, twice or three times, you're cutting the life of that site down very quickly. Um, this is one of the things I think I learned the fastest dealing with these multi little sites is like, even for us, we, we really committed to Japanese and Korean, but in the end, we have a lot of Japanese speakers, we have an office there, we had one Korean speaker, they left the company, then we had zero Korean speakers, and it's just like, we didn't even, you know, we changed the English and the Japanese, and we weren't sure what to do with the Korean, and then it got really out of date. So, so you just really have to think about your commitment level and think about, you know, if you really want to do 10 languages, how much work that's going to be to support. Um, if, if you don't have a native speaker in your orbit, how are you going to even know that you're delivering a good translation? Uh, so, popular plugins. Um, like I said, I'm a power user of two plugins in particular. I think if you do any kind of research on multilingual WordPress, these two are going to come up. Uh, they, they pop up everywhere. They're the ones other plugins are compared against. I don't, I'm not gonna say the other plugins aren't as good. They very well might be, you know, apologize to uh, new plugin developers. Um, but 
these are the ones we've used and, and had good results with both. So there's definitely a preference level. WordPress multilingual WPML, my content team loves it. So our you know, Japanese content creators uh, log in, they use it, they use the back end. It has the ability to translate the back end of the website. Um, really, they've been super happy, self-sufficient, which is my goal. I don't want to have to go post blog posts for them. Um, and on the English side too, our staff here has been very happy with them. Uh, on the flip side, my developer, one person, she's out in Las Vegas, she loves Polylang. It has so many fewer settings. It has a much more intuitive UI for configuration. It has fewer synchronization settings. Um, it is actually more expensive. So like one website in Polylang is 100, 100 euros, um, whereas $79 for WPML gives you a license that you can use forever. Um, that is kind of the bummer of Polylang, but if you're building a lot of websites and they're high-end sites, um, and you're spending a lot of translation, that's really not that much money. Um, so yeah, getting back to the UI, like this is why my content team loves Polylang, is like, or sorry, loves WPML, is like it's very straightforward, it's telling you exactly what you're doing. Um, it's showing you the translation, where to edit it. Like I couldn't even tell you what these two buttons do. One like synchronizes the post and like links them together so that if you change one, it changes the other. And the other one just like copies it once and uh, I can't count the number of times that someone on my staff has like gone to the at blank post and they've hit the copy and then they thought they were pulling in the English version to start working on for the translation and then they copied the blank post to the post with content and we lost all the content. Uh, so they, it is kind of a big deal. Um, I really wish they'd at least put like a tool tip that made sense on these. Um, and the other thing is the synchronization. So I'm a heavy advanced custom field user. So we did this uh, event site in Tokyo, it was for a conference. We had all of these different post types, we had speakers, we had you know, talks that they were giving and they were all linked. Um, and there were all these fields uh, that had you know, very field level synchronization. So for instance, the time that the talk was given, that's not something that needs to be translated. The, the talk's being given at 10 o'clock on Monday. Uh, we just want that to be the same for both posts. But we want you know, the speaker name to be edited, to be translated. We want, you know, maybe we want the company name to be copied over in case there's no Japanese text equivalent for that. Um, the, the field level, if you need that and using advanced custom fields in any way, uh, is definitely an important feature. Polyline comes with some default field um, synchronization options, um, but in general, it's simpler. That's why the developers like it. <laughs> it's just like, go figure it out, content team. Um, URL options. This comes up every time I work on one of these projects. Everyone has super strong opinions about how a URL should be constructed and how it should be not used and used. Um, and after doing, spending a lot of time and doing it every possible way, uh, directory is my favorite. It just works. It's what Apple does. I, I can't think of any better example than that. Um, you know, every, it's, it's apple.com slash whatever language code. And these language codes are actually standardized. You can go online, there's like ES, and then there's ES, I think it's hyphen AR for like Argentina. Um, and it will just make your life easier. It will take no time to configure. Um, but it comes back to your audience. So it's again, we have this like Japanese office, we do a lot of business, we incubate other companies in Japan. For us, it's super important to look like a Japanese company. To, um, so, so we have to have a .jp. It's a lot to configure. Um, every time the server changes, we got to go update multiple domains. Uh, it just seems to cause more hassle than it's worth. Um, the, well, it's not as true anymore, but um, you know the dot extensions generally align to countries, which also explain later, like which country are you going to choose for Arabic, like Egypt. Um, and then the other option that is actually the default in a lot of plugins is this parameter. So it's like question mark equals lang, you know, or something. Uh, I thought that was a great option, but frankly, after doing a few sites, it, if you're using any sort of like marketing automation or you're doing any sort of, you're passing any information in that URL, it's gonna conflict and throw it all off. Um, I, I'm pretty disappointed with how it tends to get in the way of things. But it is easy uh, to implement and a default feature, it's not awful to use. If you have a real Swiss cheese website, it might be a good way to hide the translation. 
and just like make it only available. Like if, let's say you had a blog and you have one blog post you really want to translate into French because it just needs a poem and you know it means a lot to you. Maybe that's a good way to just like tuck it in there. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of got to this, but like I, I see a lot of com like websites do this where it's like a flag and a language, and I really can't advise enough against this. Um, you know, you take countries like Belgium, which have two languages. You got uh, Hong Kong and Saudi Arabia. You know, they multiple language sites. Um, this Chinese site is actually not a website. It's just like an investment page <laughs> for Chinese investors. Uh, and, and you run into like a lot of questions like this, like, will this site take a credit card? It's a British flag, and like obviously they take your credit card. They want your money. But um, I think it raises questions for the users. It, um, language is really political too. So for instance, in some places, like in Iran, the language code will be listed as like Western Farsi. And if you talk to Iranian, they'll be like, no, my language is Persian. <laughs> and you know, they'll have no idea where that came from. Or, you know. um, and there's a lot of languages that are um, very similar. They're like the difference between like British English and American English. And they'll have separate language codes. And it, it depends on the speaker and the audience and what you're trying to achieve. And if it's just comprehension or whatever else. But, uh, I really advise just listing the language. Um, or if you're retail or e-commerce, maybe then the country flag means something else. It's, it's tax, it's some other uh, thing you want to communicate. Uh, this was gonna be my whole talk. Um, at one point I was just like, you know, it doesn't really matter what you do, just make sure you have text on your website. Uh, I, can't, I can't express how much time I've spent trying to adjust images that have a teeny bit of text on them for different versions of the website. Uh, it just just don't put text on images. It's, it's, for Google Translate, it's not going to work. For your translators, like for instance, if you use WPML or Polylang and you want to ship the whole website off to an agency to translate, um, what they're going to do is there's this software called Xlift. They're going to tell you how to find that setting. They're going to tell you how to export it. They're going to take it. They're going to give it back to you. And your whole website's going to be perfect except for all the images. And then you're going to have to manually go through and change each one and align them. And, um, you know, this isn't really even a multilingual thing. Just don't put text on images. Um, and someone pointed this out to me when they were going through my slides. They're like, "Well, what about that Google app where you hold it up to signs and it translates it in front of you?" And it's like, "Yes, that's really cool technology, but it's also like really error prone. So you're, you know, doing optical character recognition on the text, and then that's getting fired off to another API." that's gonna translate it, and there's like two things that have 80% accuracy, and the combined accuracy is probably not great. So, um, yeah, the technology's out there. I haven't seen any of the major translation company, you know, uh, machine translation companies offering it, or, or doing it by default. So, just don't put text on images. Um, so these are final thoughts. Uh, fonts, fonts come up on every project I work on, with or without language. Uh, I think it's just really important to know, and I've explained this to my developer, who's much more sophisticated than me, uh, that you can do this, but you can specify a language uh, in your CSS, and you can specify a language of the page, which is really important, once again, for search engine results, but you can also just specify it in any DOM element, like a span. Um, so if you have a web page and you just want to say, like, you know, this is this, and this is how you say it in French, you could set a span around that little block of French. I don't know why you need a different font for French. This is really more for, like, Chinese, Japanese, Korean. Um, and you can make sure you're using the right font. Um, another note on like Chinese and Japanese fonts is that uh, the character set is much bigger. It's thousands of characters and you can't just use a web font. Um, there's a few that most people have downloaded, but in general, like an entire Japanese web font would be megabytes, not kilobytes. So you're gonna have to have a few system fonts in the list that are common, um, Gothic in various forms. You can find a lot of people have written lists that you can find. Um, it, it's really important just to specify some common, otherwise you end up with this really weird page of like bold, not bold, uh, all over the map. Um, another thing, and this is just something I learned when I started at Basis four and a half years ago, was uh, a lot of languages don't have white space. So for instance, excerpts, if you have a blog that's like trying to count, you know, 40 words and then cut off, it's, it's gonna break immediately. Um, it's one of the first things I noticed when we were setting up our Japanese blog. Um, if you just set an excerpt, like if you put one in, it usually overrides the automatic dynamic content. Um, so you can do that, or you can go in and set it at a character level, but that might break up words in weird places. So just be conscious, anywhere there's dynamic content uh, that relies on white space, it's probably gonna break down. So, uh, quick review. 
uh, focus on your audience and your goals for them. Um, it, it's just really the only thing that matters when you're doing these projects. Uh, I think a lot of people get caught up in like, oh yeah, we can support five languages and it's so easy. Here's the plugin, install. Ooh, this is like confusing. Where do I get my translations from? Um, so you, you just really need to match to like what resources and expertise you have. Like maybe you have an intern one summer that speaks a language and wants to translate your site. Maybe that's great if the content's not gonna change for a long time. But if it is and then they're gone, what's your plan then? Um, machine translation, in my opinion, is an increasingly positive tool. But I, I think I don't have to dwell on the shortcomings of it. Everyone knows that there's, you can just uh, look for Twitter, like hashtag, you know, Google Translate fail, and you can have a night of entertainment. Uh, it's pretty good. Uh, human translation is better, no question. If you can afford it and you have the resources or the expertise, um, always a good choice. Uh, all of the popular plugins are hefty. I don't know if I mentioned this, but like WPML and Polylang both add, I think, like 17 or 20 tables to your WordPress database, um, which if you're already pushing the limits of WordPress, uh, could really put you into a, you know, a real hole that you can't get out of. Um, the configuration, I find to be very political. So if you're in any sort of organization or you're working with other people, uh, don't just assume that they agree with you on how you wanna you know, specify language. You know, maybe someone's just like assumes they're gonna have a dot, you know, FR site for their French and you're gonna have to explain to them what the cost of that is. Um, never put images on text and fonts and layouts, just you're gonna have to check it out. Um, another big point is like for certain languages like where the font can't come from a web font, uh, it's gonna be different, uh, you know, Windows to Mac. So uh, I actually ran into this this morning. I was like, oh, I better brush up all the uh, language, you know, fonts on our web my websites for basis tech in case anyone checks out to this meetup. And uh, sure enough, the Windows is awful, uh, so I had to change that. All right, does anyone have questions? 